All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. This is John McDougall. I am the event coordinator at Murder by the Book. It has been about a week, I think, since I have done a virtual event. I was out of the store on Saturday, and then I have actually been out of the store most of this week because I have been doing jury duty. So this is the first bookish thing I feel like I've done in a week. So I'm so glad to actually be here doing this with everybody this evening. We're super excited tonight to have Will Thomas with us to talk about his newest book, Dance with Death. But before I bring Will out, I'm going to make a couple of just general store announcement things so everybody can know what's going on with us at the store. So first up, as we've mentioned before, we haven't had any issues lately, but if you see any spam comments pop up while we are chatting uh, that ask you to click away and click on another link to watch the event, please don't do that. You don't need to do that. You're already watching the event. You don't have to click away. So I wanted to mention that. And then our big news is on Saturday, uh, Saturday, uh, April 24th is Independent Bookstore Day. We've got a lot of cool stuff coming up. There's some indie exclusive items that we'll be having for sale in store. Like they made a Baby Yoda Read onesie that's really cool. Um, and some other stuff. We'll be putting out more info about that in the upcoming store newsletter. Uh, but also at one o'clock that day, we will be hosting a virtual panel for all of the authors that have been nominated for Best Novel Edgar Awards this year. We're super excited to be able to partner with um, the MWA for this. Um, I know that they have paired up with a a lot of different stores and each store will be hosting a different uh, group of authors for all of the nominations. And then uh, the Edgar Awards are coming up soon. So we're so excited to be able to be a part of that process. Um, we wanted to thank everybody for watching us, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. And we also wanted to send a big shout out to everybody who has subscribed to us on YouTube. We found out today that we just hit 200 or 2,000 YouTube subscribers, which we're super excited about. So thank you, everybody who has subscribed. If you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, once you do that, you'll get notifications whenever we go live, we post new videos. So you definitely want to do that. Uh, one of the things that we did for Independent Bookstore Day was we created some bonfire t-shirts featuring our famous detectives. Um, I just got shipping notification today that my order that I placed, um, those had shipped like yesterday. So if you ordered them, you should be getting shipping confirmation super soon. We're so excited. We hope everybody will uh, wear those on Independent Bookstore Day and come visit us. Also wanted to mention on Independent Bookstore Day, we hope everybody will be patient. We're still requiring masks in the store and we're still limiting it to six people in the store at a time. So if you come Independent Bookstore Day, we're expecting to see lots of people, but we hope you'll just be patient with us as we try to um, manage the number of people that are in the store. Almost done. We'll bring uh, Will out in just a sec. So I wanted to mention, if you missed uh, earlier this afternoon, McKenna was live with Bonnie McBird and Les Klinger talking about Bonnie's newest uh, Sherlock Holmes book. If you missed that, you can catch it, as I said, on our YouTube channel or Facebook. And if you are historical mystery fans, which we would assume you probably are since you're joining us this evening, I'm going to be chatting with C.S. Harris and Victoria Thompson on April 28th, which we're all so excited about because we're all big fans of Victoria Thompson's. And as far as I know, she's either never been to the store or she hasn't been to the store in a really long time. So we're excited to have them paired up virtually. And as always, while I'm chatting with Will tonight, if you have any questions, please feel free to post those in the comments, either on Facebook or YouTube. And I will We'll pepper those in while we are chatting and leave uh, and leave some time at the end for more questions. So Will has just popped away from the chat. So I'm going to just open up my email real quick just to make sure there aren't any issues. And we are going to um, wait a second for him to pop back in. So while I'm here with, oh, maybe. Yeah, there we go. I think he is back. Let's see. Hello. Here I am. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so thanks for joining us this evening. Hi. Uh, so for everybody who Great is to be joining here. us, we're chatting. Yep. So for everybody who's joining us this evening, we're chatting with uh, Will Thomas, whose newest book, uh, Dance with Death, has just come out Tuesday. Uh, he is the author of the critically acclaimed Cyrus Barker and Thomas Llewellyn series, including Some Danger Involved, Fatal Inquiry, Old Scores, and Lethal Pursuit. He lives in Oklahoma. We were just talking before we went live. We think the last time that Will had to visit us in the store, we did a um, panel event with him and uh, Alex Grecian, who writes the Yard series that we're also big fans of. I think that was around the time that they both had Jack the Ripper books out. Um, or Jack the Ripper inspired books out. And I think Stephen Hunter had just released one that week too. So that was the last time we saw Will. So we're excited tonight to be able to discuss Dance with Death with him. So Will, to get us started uh, real easy, can you tell everybody who your characters Barker and Llewellyn are? 
Okay, well, we've got an older established detective, Cyrus Barker, who is large, muscular, trained in various martial arts, has been in uh, China for a good part of his life and comes to London uh, with a a lot of money that he doesn't actually tell where the money came from. And then you've got Thomas Llewellyn, who is his assistant at the beginning, is now a partner. Uh, He comes pretty much directly from prison (laughs) and uh, doesn't have a chance for any other uh, occupation at the moment. So he becomes a detective. So you've got two completely opposites. Uh, Thomas is about five foot four and Cyrus is about six foot four. <laughs> so that, that's the part of the fun there. And can you tell everybody yeah, a little part bit of about- fun is uh, working with leaders and they're growing as they, you know, as the series progresses. And, uh, you know, that that's part of the fun of it. I'd say. All right. So can you tell no, everybody sorry, a little bit that. about what they are getting? Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So can you tell everybody a little bit about what they get up to in this new book, Dance with Death? Are you there? Okay. Okay. Yes. So uh, the historical situation is that uh, to attend a royal wedding at home. So a lot of craziness starts to ensue because, you know, they're, the czar is pretty much like a god over there and can do whatever he wants. So basically you've got five or six characters just trying to get out of trouble. Uh, meanwhile, there is an assassin that's been hired and you don't know it's a female. And uh, so that's when the danger ensues. Zarovich at all costs. All right. So uh, you mentioned um, Zarovich, Nicholas. So what are some of the challenges of inserting a real historical figure into your fiction and fictionalizing them? A lot less than you would expect. Uh, what I tend to do is was involved. If I'm writing a book about the Irish, uh, I would have uh, and did have William Butler Yeats in it, not as a cameo, but because he was actually part of the movement that was going on right there. So in this book, I have Eleanor Marks, uh, who is there, sort of representing her late father. And so therefore, you know, it's it's not a cameo. They're, they're there for a specific reason that becomes part of the plot. And it's kind of fun to have a famous historical character being the suspect. And so when you're working with these historical characters uh, or just kind of historical details in general, how far do you, um, how do you know how far you can stretch kind of historical details in the name of fiction, but still have it be kind of period authentic for people who are going to be picky about those things? (laughs) Well, I mean, that happens. Uh, As long as it's in the time period, I'd say within three or four years, I mean, like, you know, if Let's say a character, an actual historical figure, was there in 1893, and the event happened in, say, 1894. I'm not going to worry that much about it. I mean, there's going to be uh, rivet counters that are going to say, "Okay, this person was not there at a, at a specific time, but 
I, I can stretch it a little bit. Uh, Nicholas's uh, mistress is in London, and she never actually came to London, but she lived in Paris. So there's, you know, I'm not really stretching it considering that you can get to London from Paris in, you know, five, five hours or whatever. So you can work with it. You know, I, I tend to want to uh, um, tweak it a little bit change a little bit so that I'm not stuck with a static character or a character that is exactly like he was. For example, Nicholas is not a really exciting guy. So if I can twist that a little bit and make him more erratic, uh, at the time he just had a, uh, just avoided a, an assassination attempt. And so he was skittering around the nervous breakdown. So that was fun to work with. So what kind of research did you do in, into, into him um, while you were working on the book? Well, I've always had an interest in him, uh, you know, because of the, his, his, the end of his life. And so uh, I must have gotten 20, 20 books altogether uh, that I studied and uh, interlibrary loans of one sort or another. And, you know, basically anything that I could find. And I certainly ended up with enough information to put into a, to a book. And I always find that rather than having to invent something, I can study enough that I can find the nugget that becomes, you know, the, the story basically. So, uh, for example, I, uh, a character that appears in, in, this, uh, in this book uh, was there at the end and, was, and tried to save the Tsar's life and was shot, you know, right before the Tsar. So he becomes a, a pivotal character in the book. And so one it's of the just, things I'm still having fun writing them very much. So one of the things I think that's always really great about long series like yours is that you have, you know, you have the opportunity to kind of build a world and you have all of these side characters that you can pull in and out. Do you have sort of a timeline so you know which some of those characters like you might not have caught up with before or in a while that you want to see again when you're working on something? book I won't put them in this book and you know so the characters have the opportunity to grow within the next couple of books mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I enjoy it that way now I know what's going to happen let's say two books down the line as far as that particular character works but I don't know the end game I don't know beyond that what's going to happen to the characters and sometimes I'm surprised <laughs> what happens to the characters because it may happen two years later and I really enjoy that part. I, I love the things that, that pop up the last minute and makes me sit there at four o'clock in the morning when I wake up going, they did what? Who? <laughs> and it tends to happen sometimes. In fact, Barker and Llewellyn met kind of that way. When I originally was working on my, my uh, first book, I couldn't decide whether I wanted a book about basically the Barker character or basically the Llewellyn character. And sure, or enough at four o'clock in the morning, I suddenly went, oh, one's working for the other. And that's how the whole thing started off. So when you started the when you started the series or were you when you were working on that first book, did you have an idea that you were working on a series and have maybe some kind of idea where it was going to go? Or are you just working on that one book and you wanted to do that one? I actually foresaw the entire series. Uh, I think at one point in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking 20. <laughs> and right now I'm working on the 13th. So, and also an, kind of an end time, I'm working until maybe 1900. And I don't know what would go on after that point. You know what I mean? I mean, I'll decide closer to that time. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to stop 
the series. If anything, I could go backwards or, or continue to you know, go with the series. It depends on, on what happens at that point. I imagine that's got to be helpful having at least kind of a Right a now, time. I'm just having too much fun with the character. I imagine that's gonna be helpful having sort of that time for like, you know, like you said, kind of a time frame or when you want to end it. I know C.S. Harris has talked about when she first started writing the books, she had, you know, expected it to take a while and then she'd been writing them and she's like, oh my gosh, I've written like six or eight books and only like two or three months have passed in the lives of my character. So I imagine that's gotta be helpful to have at least some kind of time frame to help kind of age the characters and fit in the stories that you want to be able to tell. to you know change joy working with, with different seasons this character's running and it's hot or is running and it's cold you know it's rainy it's all these different things that are uh atmospheric for the story um so I have a question from LJ Roberts. She says, um, she's read the series from the start and she loves it. So how did you decide on Victorian England and how much research did you do when you first started? Well, let's go back way, way early. When I was a kid, I my big interest was monster movies. <laughs> the old Hammer films or the old, uh, you know, uh, Universal Studios things. And they were always set in the Victorian era. You've got Dracula, you've got Frankenstein, you've got Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I, I love this combination of elegance and danger. And so it was read things like, you know, Dorian Gray and picture of Dorian Gray. And then I discovered Sherlock Holmes and just went, gaga <laughs> over it. Uh, I joined a Sherlock Holmes club and I was the youngest person there. I was 17 and the average age was about, you know, 45, 54. Uh, and so I started researching and reading and I was the book reviewer. So I wrote all these book reviews and the idea in my head was that I'm going to uh, write another Sherlock Holmes novel, you know, the great Sherlock Holmes novel, right after Nicholas Meyer, you know. And what happened was I became a purist. I decided that as far as I'm concerned, only Doyle can write Doyle. But there I was with this head stuffed full of Victorian, you know, knowledge now. And like, what do I do with it? So at that point, I decided I need to invent a character that isn't like Sherlock Holmes and put him, plunk him down in this time period and see what happens. And so uh, so for, for anybody who might not be familiar with this series, which book is the first in the series? And do you recommend they start with the first book or do you think that they can jump around? You can jump around. It's, you know, it's usually better to start, but I have no trouble with, you know, with anybody doing that. They should be able to just jump right in. In fact, they can jump right in on this book, you know, going back and starting a book number one, some danger involved. I write the them especially to be that way that you can just you know. One of the things that I see mentioned a lot in reviews for the books is uh, people are very always complimentary about plot and call them historical thrillers. And so, you know, when you're talking about Victorian mysteries, you know, thriller is not necessarily like the first word that you would think of when you're thinking Victorian mysteries. So, but your books are definitely very fast paced. So how do you balance kind of that fast paced kind of thriller-esque plot while also making sure you've got kind of all of those historical details that give the book a sense of place that people look for with Victorian fiction? It's very organic. It just really is. I, I kind of I kind of know what's going on. I know at this point I, to add some action. I know in this point to uh, concentrate on the mystery. And this point over here, I need to uh, you know work on the the actual mystery plot itself. So yes, uh, a lot of my books might consider uh, thrillers, but uh, other ones you, you have I have the opportunity to be it 
you know, very, very mystery oriented. So I've got a certain amount of freedom when I'm writing these. That nobody's going to sit there as a rule and look at them and say, okay, this one's a mystery, this one's a thriller, this one's a mystery. Uh, the whole purpose is just to tell a story. And meanwhile, my characters are growing and changing, and that was definitely reflected in uh, uh, Llewellyn's storytelling. And the things that are going on in his life that are, you know, that are changing on a constant basis. And so that's a little different from your classic, uh, you know, mystery that this character is worried about something that really doesn't have anything to do with the mystery. But uh, I include because you notice that my books on the cover doesn't say a Barker on Llewellyn mystery. This is a Barker on Llewellyn novel. So I'm dealing with things, I'm practicing things and, and playing with them that might not necessarily be in a standard mystery. Which is, I think was one of the reasons um, like long running series like yours are successful when authors are kind of able to play with um, all of the toys of the toy box and change things up. Has there ever been a time where you tried to, you know, play with one of those areas that maybe didn't work so you had to go back and rework the book? Oh, once or twice, not in a major way. I wouldn't, it wasn't a real concern to me. Uh, it was more like make sure that you have a classic mystery framework within that and make sure you have, you know, the right number of characters and make sure that these characters are, that it's possible for them to have committed the murder, that, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, um, the, you know, the characters growing over the course of the series, what are some of the ways that the characters have grown that surprised you as you've been writing them? I wasn't really expecting my character Llewellyn to, to get married. Uh, I had a character in the very first book that he meets and becomes slightly obsessed with, and then he just mentions her in the second book. In the third book, she passes right by, and all the action in the, in the book stops as he watches her carriage go by, you know? And sure enough, he, he meets up with her, and she gets married, <laughs> you know, so it, it was to somebody else. And then, you know, the guy drops dead eventually. I mean, just, just things that are going on that aren't necessarily part of the story, or, but you're so interested in in Llewellyn, how snarky he is and what a bad life he's had and how he complains and things like that, that you become interested in his personal life, not just, uh, you know, just the, the plot, the story itself. And then also uh, Cyrus Barker is so enigmatic and never explains himself that there, he's always the secondary mystery. You know, Llewellyn's wondering what is Barker doing now and what's he going to do next? Yeah, I always find that, that, that you know, the best mysteries, you know, you fall in love with the character so much that the, the mystery part just seems like an added bonus because you just get to spend time with these characters that you get to know from book to book to book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the interesting, well, for example, somebody like uh, Nero Wolf. I mean, there's a character that you will never forget. And so I read in an interview, you specifically said, to write Victorian fiction, one must read broadly and search through obscure books for that one nugget nobody has written about before. So what's something that you've learned while you've been researching that surprised you that you were like, this is the nugget that I need to use uh, for this book, for Dance with Death? Ooh, good, yes, great question. <laughs> Uh, when I was writing uh, To Kingdom Come, I needed research in, into uh, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And so I started doing research of, of all sorts and getting books in through the library from everywhere. And I got a hold of one book, and I wasn't so sure it was going to be very interesting. And I opened up, and about halfway through it, it gave all the instructions for making a uh, a, a satchel bomb, it, it, the whole process. And then it showed you the entire process for making nitroglycerin oh. from scratch. And I'm sitting there going, if the FBI even knew that I held, that held this book in my hand, I might get in trouble. But uh, 
So I decided, okay, I need to use this very, very badly because to make nitroglycerin, you need it under 31 degrees. It has to be done in frozen temperatures. And this is the Victorian era. You don't have a refrigerator you can walk into. So I've got my characters chipping ice with, you know, with picks as, as fast as they can, knowing that if the temperature rises up above 31, it will start producing a gas and 32 and the entire thing will explode. So that was part of it. Um, another situation I had, um, uh, one character that appears through the books, early books is uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon kind of the Billy Graham of, of his time, and, and Barker goes to his church. Well, at one point I wanted to have them sing a hymn, and rather than invent one, I looked in our library loan and pulled out uh, a book from uh, an obscure library that was his hymnal. So I'm, I'm using the information that I needed, and I'm about ready to send it back when I start looking through some scribbles on it and realize that I had Charles Haddon Spurgeon's copy of his book. So they didn't even know where, <laughs> what book they had, they read what book they had sent me. So I, I imagine, you, you know, your work as a librarian has to make the research process a little bit easier for you because you have access or you know where to get the things that you need. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, okay, so we've got a question from Keith, uh, your editor, or I'm assuming, is Keith, Keith Kaley your editor? Yep. Yes. So Keith is tuning in and he says that the two leads are often compared to Nero Wolf and Archie Goodwin. So was Rex Stout one of your inspirations? Yes, I love Rex Stout. His, his work is great. And uh, rather than hanging the framework on Barker and Llewellyn, uh, excuse me, on Holmes and Watson, uh, I wanted to go a, in a completely different direction. And they seem to be a good place to start. And now since that time, both characters have changed a lot. Well, at least, you know, Cyrus Barker has definitely moved away from the Nero Wolf, you know, uh, milieu. But uh, I think that, you know, you could say that Archie Goodwin and uh, Thomas Llewellyn <laughs> would be buds if they cut together. A small bit of trivia for everybody that is watching, speaking of, um, uh, Rex Stout and Archie Goodwin and Nero Wolf. So Murder by the Book, our store is actually named after the Rex Stout book, Murder by the Book. There are tons of books that have that title, but our store specifically was named after Rex Stout's Murder by the Book, and that's why we've got copies of it all over the store if you come in. Uh -huh. So LJ wants to know, she says, religion seems to be a major theme in your books and characters. She says it's different from historical mysteries that she's read um what led to that decision to incorporate that into the, the books well religion interested me as i was reading these stories uh, reading mystery fiction and you've got holmes that is i'd say an, an agnostic and you've got father brown who's a you know catholic priest and, and i thought the um you know, the Protestant faith isn't mentioned much in Victorian, in, in, in regular uh, mystery fiction. And I thought that's an interesting character to play with, that you've got a, a Baptist and he's a certain way and some things he won't put up with, like cursing and, <laughs> and taking the Lord's name in vain and things like that. And usually I include one or two uh, verses you know, within the story, but I don't try to, you know, load it up that way. It's just something that at that point that, that he would say, and that makes also makes the reader go, huh. So that was, that was the attempt, you know, to put that into the books and bring that as a subject. Like I said, I'm, I'm writing a novel here, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, bring that subject up. Um. So you, we mentioned uh, Rex Stout um, and the Nero Wolf books, and we talked a little bit about Sherlock Holmes. So when you are reading for pleasure, do you turn still? Do you still turn to mysteries, or do you try to read outside of the genre while you're writing in it? 
That's a good question. If I'm doing, like I said, my books require a lot of research. So I will be reading probably three times as much nonfiction as fiction. But after you've read so much dusty, so many dusty books, you want to turn to a nice mystery and just curl up with it and read something. Uh, one thing that you might not you know, realize that I, that I like to read is uh, Robert B. Parker, the Spencer for Hire series. I love the, the fact that he never solves the same mystery the same way. He goes in in a different way, and that's the way I want Owen Barker to be. I want Llewellyn to have no idea what he's going to do, which is good because he's not going to do the same thing that he's done in any of the other novels. And so when you're picking up uh, other mysteries, uh, who are some of the other people do you read? Do you tend to read more historical stuff or do you stay, like you said, you mentioned the Parker books, do you, do, do you tend to do more contemporary? I'd say a little bit of everything. Um, sometimes I even go out of the genre, you know, I've read all sorts of, you know, all books that, um, I've even read a Western or two. I, you know, I don't like that. As far as I'm concerned, the Western is another Victorian novel. It's just in a different location. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a conglomeration of, of everything. But I do dip into uh, contemporary Victorian era writers <laughs> and uh, just to see what you know what they're working with and how they're how they're doing it. Uh, I was reading uh, Charles Finch the other day and, and enjoying his book, but realizing it is such a polar opposite from my book in every single way that I just found it interesting that they're this is the same time period, same city, and completely different novels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess they are, I guess they are because with you know Charles is his character Charles Lennox is very much kind of the high society guy who's bored who just decides to solve mysteries because he has nothing else going on. So yeah, that is definitely the polar opposite of Barker and Llewellyn. <laughs> yes, definitely. I need to talk to Charles one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's I think that's one of the the fun things about historical fiction. You know, it's historical mysteries are 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 usually kind of our best selling section in the store. Part of that is because that's what a majority of us at the store read. I think that's kind of one of the the places where we all overlap. But it's it's so interesting how, like you said, you can have kind of so many people tackling different periods or even like the same city in a different period, and there's just so many different stories that you can tell. I talked at the beginning about, you know, elegance. Here's this elegant city where everyone's wearing fantastic clothing. And then you turn around and you're in Jack the Ripper's London. If you just take one step over into the East End and uh, it's, it's, as, it's as bad as you can possibly get. It's such bad slums and warrens and, you know, it's just a terrible place to be. So what do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions that people have about the Victorian era in general? No humor. We have an idea that they had no humor, but all you have to do is pick up an Oscar Wilde book and you're, you're laughing hysterically at his, his bon mot or uh, three, three Men in a Boat. I mean, that book just, just cracked me up and I'm sitting there going, this, these people were funny. They, they really were. And it, it helps create the character of, of Thomas Llewellyn because he's, he's genuinely snarky. The reason he's snarky is that he that was his way of surviving when he was in prison and he came out and it's become a permanent part of his, of his life. When, when you're working on him, do you ever read, do you, do you ever write something that you think, oh, wait, this might be a little too snarky and have to pull that back? Or do you do you feel like you kind of have a sense of his voice now 13 books in? Uh, that's a good question. I've so occasionally, when I'm writing humor, I'll carry it off too far, and then I'll snip it at the end, or I will cut out the middle and push <laughs> the ending in, like like a book, you know, a bookend. Uh, but I'll let him run, you know, I'll let him run with it and keep on going. And at some point, I may pull it back. And another point, I'll say, okay, I'll be brave enough to keep that one in, in the book. Uh, one of my favorite lines was, uh, he was talking to Inspector Poole and Inspector Poole said, you know, you'd laugh at your own funeral. And Llewellyn goes, maybe not, but at yours. <laughs> and then he has to step behind Barker because of the expression on the, on the inspector's face. 
So LJ wants to know, uh, before the pandemic, did you travel to London for any of your research, particularly for settings in the books? Yes, I did. I, I got there in the summer, I guess the year before uh, COVID hit, and it was miserably hot. And there was no place in the entire city that had air conditioning. And we were going to places like Stonehenge, <laughs> which felt like a giant frying pan. <laughs> it was so hot and miserable. And uh, so he didn't do as many things as he wanted to do because you just wanted to sit in the air conditioning of the hotel and not go, you know, a quarter mile it would normally be just a, just an easy walk because it was just so hot. I'm like, this is London. It's not supposed to be this hot. So what has, what is the last year kind of going through this global pandemic been like for you in terms of writing? Have you been able to, you know, sit down and actually get writing done? Or we've heard from a lot of authors that just with everything going on that they've just been too kind of distracted to get anything done. So has it been a productive time for you? Uh, it was a time, uh, we got COVID the uh, Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, which ruined Christmas immediately. And the packages stayed there until Easter for my, my daughter who doesn't live here. And so she was waiting for us to get over it. But it took six weeks uh, before we were able to, to do anything as far as, you know, get out of the house or anything like that. The, uh, the COVID hit us pretty bad. And it was just a very long thing. Now, at some point, I felt like I could, you know, get out of the house, but I kept on testing positive, even though I felt okay, you know, toward the end of it. But we all got it, and it was it was no fun whatsoever. Uh, writing wise, I got some done. I wasn't obviously as productive as I normally am, but um, sometimes it was a you know a chance to sit back. And, uh, you know, with nothing else to do, sit there and write. So is everybody doing better? Everybody's recovered now, though? Oh, yeah, we're all good. Good. I guess one of the upsides to historical fiction is you don't have to ha you don't have people asking you if you're going to include the pandemic in your book because you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Oh yeah, but I tend to use my books as a reflection of of our time. You know, so politically, things are, what are going on politically, and how can I associate them with what's going on in my novels? So I do play around with that. Uh, offhand, I can't think of a uh, something COVID-like, but we'll see what I can find out. <laughs> Yeah, from, from most of the, the contemporary authors that we've hosted with, people have asked them if they plan to include the pandemic in their book. Their response has pretty much been, hell no, who would want to read that? Which I, I don't disagree there. I don't know that I'm quite ready to pick up a book where the characters are dealing <laughs> with it. Um, mm. I do find one historical connection though. The uh, bubonic plague started out in China in the 1890s. It went across the Pacific, it reached Hawaii, and they burnt Honolulu to the ground because that's where the Chinese population was. And then it came over to the United States, reached uh, California, San Francisco, and just when it was getting ready to hit our, across the nation, the uh, San Francisco earthquake killed it dead. So if that hadn't happened, it, it saved the country, basically. So that's the sort of thing you find when you're, you know, trolling around for historical facts. So as you're- I'll as let LJ have that one, she can write about it. <laughs> <laughs> so as you are trolling around for historical facts and you're doing research for books, do you keep, like if you run across something that you're like, oh, well, this maybe not work for this book, do you keep like a notebook of things that you might be able to include later? I think mostly I keep it in my head. It's all a jumble there, but I 
you know, I always know to do something. Like this book, I knew, for example, that the wedding was going to be in 1893. The reason I knew it was because I, I keep an eye on uh, timelines. So I started out in the first, first book, I used the timeline from Scotland Yard, the Scotland Yard website. I gave a listing of all the crimes, and there was one immediately after the first book. So, of course, I'm going to start out. It was a, a bombing that occurred at Scotland Yard. And his, his offices are right next to Scotland Yard, so the first thing that would happen is his windows would blow out. So there's the beginning of the second novel automatically. But I also switched over to a regular timeline of, you know, facts, or, you know, just yearly facts. And I had it in the back of my mind that, you know, he came came to the wedding in 1893. And when it came time, you know, to decide to do something like that, I already had that fact in, my, in the back of my mind so I could use it. So we, we touched a little on this earlier, but Keith has also said one of his favorite aspects of your books is the recurring cast of minor characters, Fang Will, the cook, the butler, the dog, and Soho Vic, but they don't all appear in every book. So as we touched on this a little bit, but I can talk a little bit more about how you decide which ones are gonna appear in which books. Yes, like I said, if I've used one and said the last two or has been spotlighted in one specific book, then I'll kind of like let him go in the next book because I have enough recurring characters that I don't want to shortchange, uh, you know, the, the Chinaman Ho, you know, and, and because he ha I haven't seen him in three, three, three books. I want to be able to bring them back in uh, just the right the right order, the right amount, so you don't feel, so the reader doesn't feel like, like I've completely forgotten that character. And in fact, I may even pull one, let's say a minor, minor character that I haven't really used before. I might pull him back after five books, you know, for one bit part or another. And so how do you keep track of them? Do you have like a series Bible that you have laid out or do you, is, do you just all keep track of it in your head? I keep track of it pretty much in my head. And, uh, you know, I, I think about it at night. I do what I call four o'clocks when I wake up at four o'clock in the morning going, okay, I hadn't thought about him that for a while, you know, so I'll think about it for a while and, you know, get up and write it before I actually forget it. Because you wake up in the morning and go, I had this great idea at four o'clock in the morning. I can't remember it now. McKenna and I were joking about this Tuesday when I was briefly in the store that she and I both had those moments like where we're in the shower in the morning getting ready for work, which is why inevitably we'll get texts from each other in the morning. Hey, I just had this idea. We have to do this because it's another one of those. Oh my gosh, I had this idea. I have to get it down before I forget about it situations. But for us, it's somehow always when we're in the shower. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I always... Yes, I'm always driving. It seems like I'm, you know, I want to remember this. Mm -hmm. So I always ask this question because everybody wants to know, but I always feel bad for asking this question. So Dance with Death just came out um, just a couple of days ago. It's a brand new release, but um, what do you have coming up next? Well, there's one thing I haven't dealt with in any of the books, and that is poison. So I wanted to have some sort of a character that not only poisons somebody, but keeps poisoning people. So you've not only got Barker and Llewellyn having to find the murderer, but having to stop, save other people. And of course, at that point, you're not only wearing brush against anything, anything in your toothpaste, anything in your tobacco. So, uh, you know, the fun of that is, is just that, the, the no place is safe at that mo moment, even though they're in their own house or their own offices. So, so I'm looking for, I'm writing that and enjoying it very much. It's something I haven't done before. And Barker can't that's, punch that's, his way out, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that's interesting that you haven't done poisons yet since that's such a, a staple of the genre. I've just, on my second cozy in a row that I've read where poison was the main, was the main murder weapon. So it's interesting that that just hasn't been something that you've done in the books yet, especially with Victorian period where you kind of tend to associate that. Yeah. 
yeah, well, you know, Barker wouldn't be happy if he, you know, you can't punch the, the bottle of poison. You know, it just doesn't work. But uh, yeah, it, the the good thing about poison is it's so it's so scary because it 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 sits there quietly and you don't know about it until you know until you're dead, uh, and you know it's different from the usual situation that, that Barker would face. And since he's such an active person, uh, he has to change his tactics. And like we were talking about earlier, you know, the thing is, I don't want it to be the same as it was in the last book. And therefore, like I said, poison is not something I've dealt with before. So it was time to bring it out. It's always great to hear. I, I love the way that you've been talking about the characters and you can tell that you're still having, like you said have multiple times, that you're still having so much fun with them. And it's always interesting to me how authors can find ways to kind of twist a series or play with it a little bit, but kind of still keep it at its core. You know, as much as we love the Jack Reacher books, you know, you know, when you pick one up, you know that Jack is going to come to town. There's going to be some problem. Like you said, he's going to kind of punch his way through it. He's going to solve the problem and move to the next town. And, you know, there are some series that we know you know exactly what you're going to get when you pick it up. And that's why you keep picking up these books because they're comfort. But it's also always nice to be able to pick up one of your books and know, like, you know what you're going to get, but you don't always know, you know, kind of how it's all going to play out. So it's always interesting to hear how you yourself kind of yourself entertain when you're this far into a series. Yeah, I uh, never, make things, never make things too easy for Thomas Llewellyn in one way or another. Uh, my theory has always been that our bodies are, are simple machines and when we uh, have certain stimuli, uh, our body reacts the same way. Whether it's getting fired from your job, getting turned down by, by your girlfriend, finding out you have a disease or anything like that, your body reacts the same way. And so that's what happened with, with Thomas Llewellyn. He's, he's always getting something that knocks him back and, and he has to struggle and, and get back into the fight again. Awesome. Well, I think we are about out of time for this evening, but I just wanted to recap for anybody who might have joined us uh, midway through. We have been talking with Will Thomas, whose newest Barker and Llewellyn book, Dance with Death, just came out Tuesday. Uh, if anybody's interested in ordering copies, we've got them in the store. If you want to start with the first book in the series, we've got those as well. Um, as we've said before, you can order those at murderbooks.com or you can come visit us. We are open. Um, of course, we know everybody is not um, getting out and about yet, still doing some curbside pickup stuff. So if you want to do curbside, we well, are not putting the table out anymore because we haven't had as many people taking advantage of that. But if you just call us when you pull up, we, can, we are happy to run your book out to the parking lot for you. Um, we mentioned Independent Bookstore Day is coming up on Saturday, April 24th. So we hope people will come see us for that. And if you missed any part of our chat with Will, once we are done, Facebook and YouTube will archive them so you can rewatch. Or if you want to check out any of the other author events that we've got on there, we tallied them up pretty recently. And since actually last weekend, and since the pandemic has started, we have hosted over 200 author events with 350 different um, authors. So there is a wealth of content out there if you guys want to go check that out. And if you are watching on YouTube, uh, we hope that you will subscribe so that way you'll get notified as get uh, stuff up. So Will, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It was so great to get to chat with you again. I had so much fun. And hopefully by the time the next book comes out, we will actually be able to host you in the store again and we'll get to do this with readers in store and, and get to see you face to face. Yes. So I can <laughs> buy more books. Yes. <laughs> Take care. Have a good night. Bye.